Mission and Margin is the business of healthcare. I'm your host, Matthew Hannes. In this interview, we explore insurance captives and cyber risk management. Captives are an alternative to commercial carriers for professional liability, property, and workers' comp insurance. Captives influence the reduction in malpractice claims and, more importantly, catastrophic patient injuries. Cyber may be a new risk well suited to captive insurance structures. My guests are Health System Executive Rebecca Cady and Healthcare Cyber Risk Management Innovator Bob Chaput. Rebecca Cady is Vice President and Chief Risk Officer for Children's National Health System. She oversees clinical and enterprise risk, insurance, and captive services in litigation. She earned her nursing undergraduate degree from Georgetown University and a law degree from University of San Diego. Children's National is a top 10 U.S. children's hospital serving 219,000 patients annually. Founder of Clearwater, Bob Chaput is a healthcare cyber risk management influencer, educator, and entrepreneur. His insights have been featured in healthcare and cyber security publications, association journals, and general news outlets. And he was a contributing co-author to Ashram's 2017 Fundamentals of Risk Management textbook. Clearwater empowers hundreds of hospitals and health systems, including many of the top IDNs, to manage cyber risks and ensure patient safety. We'll explore Rebecca's use of an insurance captive to manage and transfer cyber risk and Bob's in-depth understanding, perhaps greater than any expert I've spoken with, of how health systems should identify, manage, and avoid cyber risk. We start with key highlights followed by the full interview. So if we think about first do no harm and then some other core tenets of healthcare around quality care and access to care and timely care, think of those three dots, and then what information risk management is about is confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Well, there's a connection between all of those. And um, one could easily discuss a compromise of confidentiality and what adverse effect that could have on quality of care, access to care, and timely care, and similarly for integrity and, uh, and availability. So I, I think a, a, a key point, and more and more organizations are coming to realize it, is that it's not an IT problem, it's an enterprise risk management problem, and it is about patient harm, patient safety, and quality of care. Mm. I think the reasons many organizations decide to have a captive uh, consist of their having um, some, some difficulty in getting commercial insurance at a rate that they believe is reasonable. And then a second is that it allows you to really um, give your organization some skin in the game when it comes to managing your risk. In the absence of understanding what the exposures actually are, there's a oftentimes a blanket approach. It takes the form of the latest controls checklist right. without regard to whether that's causing me to overspend or underspend. And so there's a great deal of, of reactionary, tactical spot welding going on mm. as compared to a more proactive and strategic and architectural approach. You know, we've seen hospitals make great strides in patient safety by doing that with their malpractice. And it's my opinion that cyber is another good avenue for, um, for that kind of uh, creating that sense of urgency around managing your cyber. Because again, it's really not just an IT issue, it's an enterprise risk issue. I mean, one employee can bring your whole cyber system down. So because of that, you really don't do yourself or your patients any favors by saying, well, we're just going to transfer all this risk to insurance. Health South is one of a number of examples where we've actually assisted an organization in operationalizing their program establish it, implement it, and then be in a place to mature it over time. I don't think we're all that far off, truthfully, from having, having some kind of event where patients are harmed because yeah. somebody has hacked into a device somehow. So we're seeing the, the expansion of the breadth of what organizations need to cover, not only from a regulatory point of view, but really from a risk and exposure point of view. Traditional IT assets, the biomedical devices, and then other devices and systems that are part of the Internet of Things that could have, if not a direct impact 
on confidentiality or integrity or availability could have an indirect impact on it. So the, the, the universe of devices and systems and, and houses, uh, data uh, homes, if you will, okay. is expanded tremendously. Putting cyber in your captive allows you to leverage the attention of your organization's leadership in terms of figuring out what your vulnerabilities are and taking steps to protect against them so that you're not just transferring all that risk via buying an insurance policy, but you've got some skin in the game. It's putting a, an OPEX line item in a CAPEX line item that everybody can sort of see and relate to. Right, and be held accountable for yeah. as well. The reduction of risk, mm -hmm. how does that fit into your world? Well, we do that primarily through our enterprise risk okay. platform. Um, which uh, consists of a couple of different components. We really do a granular bottom-up uh, portion of it. So frontline staff, managers, supervisors, directors, and on up. And then we do a top kind of strategic risk assessment mm -hmm. portion as well. So um, operationally, those folks are supposed to identify and manage their operational risks at a departmental level. Um, but then the strategic risks are managed by the leadership that reports directly to the CEO and, of course, on up to the board. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of parsed it out that way because we realized that, especially in healthcare, and I think apropos to what we were talking about earlier, you can have an event happen at a very low level of the organization that escalates very quickly and very um, profoundly and can cause great risk. and a potential catastrophic loss. So you can't ignore the granular risks. At the same time, if you're not managing your strategic risks, i.e. if nobody's steering the ship, then that's obviously not good either. You don't want to be too focused on the granular things and let the big picture things slip by you. So it's an approach we're, we're working. And um, I think it's iterative like anywhere else. You know, healthcare is not as... Um, as facile with enterprise risk as many other kind of industries, finance, you know, the financial services industry for, for a prime example. But as we, you know, as we proceed, we may decide to do it differently, but that's how we've approached it. And so give me, could you give me a, an example of a strategic risk versus a granular risk? So a strategic risk is, are we ready for um, the value to volume switch, right? because you can't do business in volume and do business in value at the same time and do it well, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The different drivers. So that's a strategic risk. A granular risk is we only have one guy in this department who knows how to do X. If he gets hit by a bus, nobody else knows how to do it and we don't know where to find his stuff. Take a moment and describe the value proposition of Clearwater Compliance. And fundamentally, what we do is help people understand, identify, and understand their risks so they can then make more informed decisions about how they're going to treat those risks. Give me an example of, of a client situation where you've been brought in to serve. One of them that, that comes to mind, uh, one of our clients is Health South. Um, they have uh, hundreds of rehab hospitals and by way of acquisition, hundreds of hospice and home health locations all around the U.S. And their single biggest problem, especially with the ubiquity of all the devices that are out there today, is understanding all the possible things that could go wrong. Mm -hmm. And their issue was how do we conduct at a granular level an enterprise-wide risk analysis or risk identification work how do you do that manually in this day and age? Risk analysis involves understanding where all the PHI lives, all the threats to it, all the vulnerabilities, what controls you may or may not have in place. So there are a number of ingredients that come to play. They looked at it at an enterprise level and said, how do we possibly do this on spreadsheets anymore? And said, we, we are looking for a platform that enables us to not only conduct the risk analysis and risk identification initially, but then have a platform upon which we can operationalize our information risk management program. We regard information risk management as a 
is a key component of overall enterprise risk management today. So the, the Health South is one of a number of examples where we've actually assisted an organization in operationalizing their program, establish it, implement it, and then be in a place to mature it over time. And when it comes to risk management in, in the IT world and that around cyber and information, there's a lot of arts and crafts yeah. going on. And we're helping to move it over into the world of science and engineering, if you will. We've given them executive dashboards that they've not had access to before. They've got a platform upon which they're now maintaining that which has been put in place. Makes it highly efficient and very, very effective, ultimately. Hmm. Tell me the, the impetus that led Children's National to have a captive. Well, that was long before my time, but um, you know, I think the reasons many organizations decide to have a captive uh, consist of the following. Uh, first of all, they're having um, some, some difficulty in getting commercial insurance at a rate that they believe is reasonable and fits within the financial uh, picture of what their organization is going through at the time. Um, and you know that's often the case with with healthcare organizations, but not always. Um, and then then a second, and I think the more important thing is that it allows you to really um, give your organization some skin in the game when it comes to managing your risk. So, for example, you know um, as as we like to say, if you can measure it, um, then you can put it in your captive. And doing so allows you to create the organizational urgencies around how are we going to manage this risk? Because now we've got skin in the game in terms of you know, the actuarial um, accounting business where you have to send money to your captive overseas. And that's obviously, you can't keep that in your operating budget. So if you're putting money into your captive, then what are you going to do back at home to manage that risk and it creates um, a sense of urgency around that that the board can hold you accountable for um, which is is important it's you know we've seen hospitals make great strides in patient safety by doing that with their malpractice and it's my opinion that cyber is another good avenue for um, for that kind of uh, creating that sense of urgency around managing your cyber because, again, it's really not just an IT issue, it's an enterprise risk issue. I mean, one employee can bring your whole cyber system down. So because of that, you really don't do yourself or your patients any favors by saying, well, we're just going to transfer all this risk to insurance. Tell me a little bit more about that. Right. So putting cyber in your captive allows you to leverage the attention of your organization's leadership in terms of figuring out what your vulnerabilities are and taking steps to protect against them so that you're not just transferring all that risk via buying an insurance policy, but you've got some skin in the game, you have money in your captive, you have hopefully some of kind of a deductible back home in the organization's budget so that leadership has an incentive to aggressively manage the risk. It's putting a, an OPEX line item in a CAPEX line item that everybody can sort of see and relate to. Right, and be held accountable for yeah. as well. What do you think are the biggest innovation opportunities in captives today? Um, I think that captives are a great vehicle for really supporting an enterprise risk program. So in other words, you have your various silos of insurance. You have cyber, you have PLGL, you have property, you have aviation, automobile, whatever. But you can really use your captive as kind of an umbrella to sit over those and create an all risk protection. Um, one of the biggest things that healthcare organizations worry about is their business interruption, which may or may not be covered by those individual siloed policies. And there may be gaps in between those policies. Um, for example, if um, you have some kind of a, an attack on your hospital and there's no damage to your property, your property's not damaged, but people aren't coming to your hospital. So what's going to cover that business interruption? Probably nothing. But you can craft things within your captive to help you cover those things. And, and the, the, the premise there being, when you write the policy between Children's National and the captive, you control what language is used and you transfer that risk in a mechanism that you want it to be transferred. Right. 
and then within the captive, you either self-insure it or, or you, you re go reinsure it. And or you maybe a little bit of both. If each level of the organization, for example, the, the parent as well as the captive are taking some skin in the game there, it makes it a lot easier for you to talk to the reinsurers about what they might be able to do to cover you, especially when you're talking about the higher levels of your tower. 20% mm -hmm. of the healthcare leaders we spoke to, their reaction was, putting cyber into your captive is a terrible idea because you're exposing your captive reserves to a very volatile and unpredictable risk. It all depends on how you structure it. You know, again, you can create the different levels of, um, of coverage and exposure as to what makes sense for your organization. And, and again, if you're creating that incentive for leadership attention by putting it in your captive, then you're taking steps to minimize your exposure. Um, at least those things that you're, you know, that are capable of being managed. Um, so I, our experience has been that it's powerful. Again, um, we did it with patient safety, and I suspect that maybe 20, 30 years ago, you know, people might have had some qualms about, well, you know, how do we manage that um, high-value brain-damaged baby case and and do we really, this is unpredictable, or for example, another kind of black swan thing, um, is the provider conducting activities that are you know, criminal and sexually abusive in nature? That's potentially catastrophic, and you know, there are certain things one can do to manage that, but at the end of the day, you know, th there's some leap of faith there. You, know, you screen your people, you have processes in place, but but it's not possible to completely prevent it. It's kind of like cyber. I mean, you can't build Fort Knox. Nobody can afford that. So thinking about the, the boards that you've worked with, the health system boards that you've worked with, what's the greatest insight you've drawn around cyber? One is a, a good one, a growing realization that it's not an IT problem, that it's a multidisciplinary matter that needs to involve everyone from IT to compliance to clinical engineering to the guy who sweeps the floors. Um, if somebody's coming in and wants to access one of your LAN rooms, do you let that guy in there? If you're the guy pushing the broom, everybody, yeah, even really, and we've approached patient safety that way as well. Everybody in the organization has a role. Mm. The second thing is perhaps not so good in the absence of understanding what the exposures actually are there's a, oftentimes, a blanket approach. It takes the form of the latest controls checklist right. without regard to whether that's causing me to overspend or underspend. And there's, uh, there are two mistakes that can be made when it comes to making OPEX, CAPEX, and in fact, risk transference decisions. And it boils down to either underspending or overspending. Mm -hmm. And so, um, in the absence of good information about my exposures, which are unique from yours, which are unique from the next hospitals, the controls checklist or blanket approach, I think, is, is, um, has been a failing. And it's been the result of um, uh, reacting on the basis of the latest headline, do we have one of those? Uh, are we patching our systems? Mm -hmm. Do we have anti-malware when the uh, PETCHA and not PETCHA uh, attacks occurred. <laughs> and so there's a great deal of, of reactionary, tactical spot welding going on mm -hmm. as compared to a more proactive and strategic and architectural approach. I don't think we're all that far off, truthfully, from having, having some kind of event where patients are harmed because yeah. somebody has hacked into a device somehow. Um, laying aside the question of why in the world anybody would want to do that. But, um, but I just think in healthcare we're far enough behind on cyber to begin with, and we're just kind of starting to open that door into the room of, look at all these wireless devices we have. You know, I would hope to see collaboration between the device manufacturers and the, mm -hmm. the uh, chief information security officers of the world to try to kind of more quickly figure out what can be done to make those things more, um, more hardy. Oftentimes, <clears throat> what we're seeing a day in the life of the typical chief information officer is the, 
the absence of that complete purview, right. a lot of departmental decision making being made and devices added to the network about which the CIO or the security officer is not completely idea. aware. Right. And that gets to, if you're going to identify risk, it needs to start with a really rigorous inventory of where all the PHI, all the sensitive information lives. And in a, a, a recent session, we had uh, spent two days with two OCR investigators who asked not only about the traditional IT assets, the mm -hmm. EHR system in pharmacy and radiology, et cetera, not that there aren't enough of those, right. but they went squarely into the world of biomedical devices, as we spoke a moment ago. And furthermore, this was an interesting point of discussion, into the building management systems that are now part of the Internet of Things. And mm -hmm. in the following way, uh, I pose the question, but the HVAC system does not create, receive, maintain, or transmit electronic protected health information. How do you regard that within the purview mm -hmm. of the Office for Civil Rights? And the response was, all reasonably anticipated threats need to be considered. If the HVAC system is attacked and taken down, as it was, by the way, the attack vector in the famous Target case. Mm -hmm. And that, in turn, results in servers in the data center having to be shut down because of a lack of appropriate cooling. And that results in the unavail unavailability of sensitive information. A patient may not be able to be treated in a timely manner in that circumstance. So we're seeing the, the expansion of the breadth of what organizations need to cover, not only from a regulatory point of view, but really from a risk and exposure point of view, traditional IT assets, the biomedical devices, and then other devices and systems that are part of the Internet of Things that could have, if not a direct impact on confidentiality or integrity or availability, could have an indirect impact on it. So the, the, the universe of devices and systems and, and houses, uh, data uh, homes, if you will, right. is expanded tremendously. Right. You could even, you could even um, from that example, have, for example, a, a loss of materials. There are many pharmaceuticals, vaccines as a primary example, um, that have to be maintained at certain temperatures. And if someone attacks your power grid or your HVAC system, and those items go without, you know, go outside of their appropriate range, then you're left with, you know, potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of supplies that you have to throw out. There are new vulnerabilities that we need to consider in this very amorphous space right now, which makes risk management of, uh, or I'll say, information risk management mm -hmm. a very complex uh, body of work that organizations need to undertake. What you're pointing out is this bleeds into patient injury, it bleeds into property damage, it bleeds into loss of income. It, t take exactly. that take that idea a little further for me, Rebecca. Well, or let's say that let's say your um, pharmaceuticals or your blood or something comes out of temperature um, compliance and you don't realize it and you give it to a patient and then the patient is harmed somehow. Um, so I mean all of these things at a granular level can can result in direct patient harm. Um, there's almost like a cascading effect. Mm -hmm. You have um, a very, very wide number of granular exposures, granular risks, and uh, a cascade of potential losses. Where's the innovation opportunity here? It sounds like an awfully big problem. Where's the innovation? We would approach that in terms of kind of a high reliability paradigm. So in other words, how do you how do you make everybody a risk manager in some respects? Mm -hmm. How do you make sure that the folks at the front line, that, how do you be deferential to their expertise? Um, how do you have channels for them to raise up the concerns and issues that they see in their daily work? Um, because the guy in the pharmacy who's responsible for these very expensive drugs, some of which are you know, $100,000 a dose, that guy knows how this drug is supposed to be managed and kept, and so he knows if something goes wrong with the fridge that we're out 100000 bucks. and by the way, this patient who's really, really sick and needs it, 
won't have it mm -hmm. because then we'll have to get another dose from somewhere else and there will be delay in care and so forth. So how do you give that guy um, the sense that what he knows is important, mm -hmm. the channels to escalate that information and the responsiveness to say, okay, here's, we're gonna empower you. How would you prevent against this bad thing happening? Mm -hmm. And then follow through with it and then recognize folks for that. So to me, to my mind, it's all about, it's about high reliability, driving that um, deference to expertise down to the frontline experts, making sure that leadership is very sensitive to operations, making sure that there's a culture where you can ask questions where you can peer check and peer coach and where you can have a conversation about things without people um, getting upset with you for raising issues. Mm -hmm. Those are the kinds of things I think that really s places who can do that well, I think will that's the place to start with managing these because no one person or no one department can manage it. It really has to be everybody's job. If I were a insurance, a cyber insurance underwriter, I might argue that evaluating the culture may actually be a really, really important underwriting <clears throat> component. Does that, does that make sense? I would advocate for that position, yes. So if I had $5 million of capital that I could apply to this problem as an innovator, where would be, where would be the place to put that capital? What would be the thing that would have the most impact? Partially towards training and education of staff, um, but then, um, how do you engineer your processes so that it's easy to do the right thing, hard to do the wrong thing? Classic example, um, how do you, um, do you um, buy tubes for your IV products where um, certain products that have to be given in a certain way can only be hooked up in a certain way? So how do we engineer our processes like that? Now, not everything can be engineered, mm -hmm. right? So, so then, how do, you, how do you make sure that your people think? I think part of the education and training really ideally is um, behavioral interviewing. How do you hire the right people in the first place to make sure that the people that are coming on board have those attitudes where you know, they have a questioning attitude, they're not afraid to speak up. But I think fundamentally, if you're gonna create an organization that can manage its enterprise risk well, you have to start, start there. I think about some of the results that the Office for Civil Rights has examined as they've looked at the risk identification and HIPAA parlance risk analysis work mm -hmm. that's been done. There have been uh, 52 cases that have gone through to a corrective action plan and resolution agreement. 39 have involved our subject matter to the extent they've involved electronic protected health information. Mm -hmm. and in. 35 of the 39 cases, there have been adverse findings when it came to risk identification, that very fundamental thing. And uh, over and over again, OCR has cited uh, the lack of comprehensiveness mm -hmm. in doing that work, the lack of, 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 of a method, methodology or discipline that follows either their guidance that they've published or a framework like the International Standards Organization or NIST, the National Institute of Standards and, and Technology. The other area where organizations have been dinged, if you look at those 35 cases, is a lack of granularity. And uh, by way of example, um, w w when we look at a system like EPIC, the Electronic mm -hmm. Health Record System, and do risk analysis, that's very interesting. We're looking at EPIC, but the real question is where does the PHI live? It lives on servers, it lives on backup media, it lives on workstations on wheels, it lives on laptops and desktops. Well, if I've got a laptop, I'm a home health clinician, um, one threat is I may be in Starbucks in between appointment, there might be a shoulder surfer that comes by. And the vulnerability is I don't have a privacy screen. Mm -hmm. That's a risk. When there's an asset and a threat and a vulnerability, that's a risk, that's one. That level of granularity is where we've seen the enforcement agency, it's certainly at the federal level, the Office for Civil Rights go. And it's not until you get to that level of granularity, when we look at laptops, we look at 52 of those scenarios so that we cover all the reasonably anticipated threats and all the reasonably anticipated vulnerabilities. Then and only then, for each one of those, can I apply the likelihood of the bad thing happening, 
and the impact of the bad thing happening and put a value on it so that I, can, I may then risk rank order all of my risk but it just puts organizations, people in a much better uh, position to make informed decisions if they understand the totality of exposures and have them risk rank ordered. And that's, that's where I think, <laughs> I don't want to put words in your mouth, but as you talk about the tools or, or a platform for being able to do this work efficiently and effectively, that's where I think organizations will benefit. You have built the list. So in other words, you, you made the comment, make sure I understand it correctly, there are 52 things about laptops that you check when you're working with a health system yeah. to inventory their risk identification at a granular level. So that, that list, that body of work, that is intellectual property that's of value because you bring efficiency. You've already figured out what that list is. Well, that's correct. And it's, and it's a dynamic changing list because who thought about Petya? Who thought about not Petya? Mm -hmm. Who thought, thought about WannaCry? And what we've done is we've brought all of that into the form of tables that are regularly updated because of the very changing dynamics that we have when it comes to cyber. D does that resonate with you, Rebecca, that, that idea of, of having that uh, inventory of things to be looking at? Or is that something that emerges uh, better from an organization looking unto itself. As the vice president in charge of all this, I don't, there's no way I could know all those things that we need to look at. Right. That's why we need to, you need to go, it's like going to, going to Gemba, right? Yeah. You need to go talk to the people yeah. who do the work and let them tell you, how, what are the 20 ways that things in your area could go wrong and cause some kind of catastrophe? They'll tell you, and it may be 30 or 40 different ways then you want to check them against some kind of external source, right? So if my people are telling me we only have these two or three risks in this area, how am I going to validate and verify that with some kind of outside expert? So if we think about first do no harm and then some other core tenets of healthcare around quality care and access to care and timely care, think of those three dots, and then what information risk management is about is confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Well, there's a connection between all of those. And um, one could easily discuss a compromise of confidentiality and what adverse effect that could have on quality of care, access to care, and timely care, and similarly for integrity and, um, and availability. So I, I think a, a, a key point, and more and more organizations are coming to realize it, is that it's not an IT problem. It's an enterprise risk management problem. And it is about patient harm, patient safety, and quality of care. Mm. Being um, agile and fast, when you, do, when you find out that something bad has happened, when you do the wrong thing, mm -hmm. you need to follow it up by doing the right thing. You, you need to have systems in place to allow you to quickly identify issues escalate them appropriately within the organization and manage them quickly. Um, because I think there's, you know, although some folks may become sort of immune to the idea of cyber breaches, right? Is there a single, is there a person in the United States who's done any kind of commerce, used a credit card who hasn't been hacked? I mean, I'd like to see that person because I doubt such a person exists on the one hand. But on the other hand, when it comes to our healthcare, our health information, and especially in our circumstances, the health of someone's child or the information of someone's child, it's imperative that we do the right thing after something bad has happened. This is the cost of doing business. Everybody's going to get hit. That's mm -hmm. right. Everybody's going to get hit. You can't build Fort Knox. So then what do you do when it happens to you? And how do you behave and respond? And I think that really um, demonstrates the character and quality of the organization probably a little bit more than the question of, you know, did you get hacked in the first place? Because mm -hmm. you can do everything right and still get hit. Rebecca Cady, Bob Shaput, thank you so much for joining the business of healthcare. Thanks. Thank you.